This is the Powered Up Podcast, show 93. I try to facilitate experiences that I didn't have, that I, I wasn't exposed to. So now I try to bring that to the classroom, tie it in with the biology, tie it in with the content, and it turns into just facilitating opportunities, creating experiences, like you said, which is huge because kids walk away with those experiences. They're always going to remember. They're, they might not remember the content per se, but they're going to remember what they did during that time that were, they were experiencing whatever they did. And uh, being able to, to share these stories with my kids of me growing up along the border, that's one of the things also about creating these genuine relationships. The kids in my classroom, a majority of my kids get to see a little bit of themselves in me. Welcome to a real world education with insight and advice from teachers in the game, where current and former educators reveal what truly sets apart the great teachers and what it takes to make a positive impact on students. Whether you're in pre-service learning, new to the game, or a seasoned veteran, this is the show for you. You'll leave feeling inspired to take action because we are powering education by empowering you. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ken Erman, host of the Powered Up Podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Mr. Matt. Looks like he's ready to go camping, Rogers. Matt, you're sitting here in a Patagonia jacket in the middle of October when you're sitting indoors. I know you're not feeling well, but you really do look like you're ready to go backpacking. I mean, I would take, you know, the fact that my bags are packed and I'm ready to hit the trails, but... This is keeping the heat inside. I'll zip it up a little higher so that I am able to maintain my time with you and this great conversation we just had. Yeah, we had a we had a great interview tonight with uh, Raymond Benavides from El Paso, Texas. Uh, just really humble, really centered, really interesting stories, and just continues to add to the legacy of this podcast in the fact that we have just unbelievable guests. We are just so blessed and fortunate to have the teachers on that we have. And it just goes to show you that there are so many amazing teachers out there. And I really just marvel every week at the conversation that we're having, the person we're talking to, the instructional strategies that they discuss, the way they facilitate their classroom, and just how good of a person they are. I mean, it's, it, it just, it's crazy to me. We are we are fortunate, and I don't know if I, you know, earned my seat. I know it was a joke long, long time ago, you know, earned my seat at this conversation because, you know, what we keep on hearing is that it's not a big deal what I'm doing. You know, anyone can kind of do what I'm doing week in and week out. And I'm not saying myself, I'm saying our guests who, you know, are getting accolades for being great educators what's amazing is a lot of these people are representing their commitment to education and we heard that tonight that you know when raymond kind of decided he was education was his path and knew it like he was all in his family was all in you know there was no choice and sacrifices and and the ways that he could drive students to be the best version of themselves and see what they could turn into was the emphasis of his day in and day out process of being a teacher it's you know i don't want to say fairy tale esque but a lot of these conversations including tonight's is you know the teacher you want your kids to have because they are committed as you would want and a lot of us are to the position a lot of us represent education as the best version of ourselves which is all you can ask i think you summed it up perfectly in the message and just the vibe that we that we got with him tonight and and so i really don't want to delay it any further because it's such a great conversation so let's jump right into our interview and our conversation with raymond benavides 
This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Hi, Raymond. Welcome to the Powered Up Podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How about yourself? We are doing great. I'm super excited to have you with us uh, as we got to know you a little bit, just meeting to check technology and now jumping on for this interview. Uh, we, I understand you have shared that you've listened to a few of our episodes, so that's really cool for Matt and I. Uh, and I, the first thing I said is, what do you think? And I got some authentic feedback from you on our show and how we can improve. So for our audience, let's have you officially introduce yourself. Let us know where you are coming from and give us a snapshot of your career in education. I'm Ray Benavides. I am coming from you to uh, from El Paso, Texas, uh, far west Texas, uh, right along the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, part of the Isleta Independent School District. I teach at a high school, the Valle High School, and I teach uh, biology, anything biology, from uh, ninth grade to twelfth grade. I also teach at our local community college. So um, uh, I won't say I'm an expert in biology, but I guess I'm pretty familiar with the subject for for, uh, and I thoroughly enjoy teaching it as well. So, what would you say? So in high school, most of the kids taking your class are forced to take it. Is that fairly accurate, especially the younger grades, ninth, 10th grade? Is that? Yeah, really it's, a, it's a ninth grade. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a ninth grade requirement. And in Texas, says it's the only uh, science that's tested. So it's a, it's a, it's a, they need it for graduation. So they have to take an end of course exam. And that comes at the end of their ninth grade year. Uh, that was in the first few, I wouldn't say until about two years ago, three years ago, I've slowly been transitioning to the upper level courses. Now I teach AP bio, I teach dual enrollment bio, and I'm um, also teaching, uh, we've started off, we started off with a biomed program uh, at our school. So now I'm, te- I'm teaching uh, uh, principles of bioscience. So uh, this year, this is my first year where I don't have, or, or I'm, I'm not held accountable for a, a freshman, a freshman general science, a biology, a biology class. Okay. So you have, you have your upper level science classes where those students clearly have an interest, especially at the AP level, they're interested in the, in the course content. Um, and so they're going to have a natural inclination to be engaged with the content that you're doing compared to your ninth graders who are forced to take your class, not to say that they don't enjoy it and they're not engaged with you as a great teacher, but how do you approach that group differently from the standpoint of trying to get them interested and trying to get them engaged because you know they didn't choose to be there versus your other group, you can kind of just lay out the content and the experiences and you know they're going to buy in a little bit more. It's been all through trial and error throughout the years. Uh, what, what's worked for me is really trying to create these uh, relationships with my students. I, and it, I know it's it, it's easier said than done, but it took years of uh, trying to master that that art. And uh, I what I what I like to do is I allow my kids to feel welcomed into the class. Uh, goes back goes back to the uh, uh, you know having them feel welcome and, and, and acknowledging that each one of them brings a set of a set of skills a skill set or a set of experiences that I could feed off of in order for them to get interested or be interested or stay engaged with with the content uh, uh, I try to tie a lot of it into the especially with uh, with diseases I go back to the medical field the medical side of it so the kids can be uh, stay hooked. And there's different there's different things that I try to do, but most importantly is 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 what I spend the first two weeks uh, of school is trying to create these relationships, trying to get to know my kids, trying to know a little bit about them, coming back to them every day, asking them questions about about what's happening outside of school and outside the classroom, especially if they're in sports or they're involved in an extracurricular activity or academics or whatever it may be, or just their family has a, a business or they own a restaurant. I just like to go out there and just ask them and have them feel comfortable. So when they come in. It's, it's like a mutual respect that you know, as, uh, once they come into my class, they're going to stay engaged and, and I'm going to, I'm going to treat them with respect. One of the things that I love about biology, and I was not a great student of biology in my high school experience by any means. Um, but one of the things that I really enjoy about that subject area is there is actually a benefit to the idea that it's tested, you know, It is a prioritized skill that has a lot of value for kids beyond, you know, their, their high school journey. As a fourth grade teacher, we're the only grade level that has to teach science in the elementary realm, which means that in our schedule, a lot of time is provided, you know, a lot of time resources are provided in our grade level. We can justify it a lot more. What are some of those advantages that you feel like with 
the, you know, a lot of times we look at the lens of standardized testing as being a difficult, you know, barrier to our instruction. In this case, you know, it's a, a marker for graduation. It's also, you know, an emphasized skill that all students are receiving and taking. How, how would you rank the pros and cons of uh, standardized testing on your curriculum and really the influence of what you're doing? Is it completely, you know, a, a barrier? Is it, you know, there are positives and negatives? Is it actually something that's great for you in your career? How, how would you frame it? In the beginning of my of my career, it was it was a barrier because that's all I could focus on and that's all I could think about. And uh, at that point in time, I was a new teacher. I was worried about you know meeting the standards or being asked to not teach the subject anymore or or, or being placed somewhere else. So uh, once again, it was a, 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 an evolutionary process of bringing biology. It was uh, and 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 throughout the years, I started learning. So what I started focusing on focusing on is teaching beyond the test and making the test secondary. And that's what I do in my classroom is, is I, tr I try to teach. And I, actually, I was asked the same question, a question similar to this uh, by our, the Texas Education Agency, the agency that uh, the, 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 the educational board that runs our, our, our state, uh, state uh, curriculum and so forth. They asked me what did I thought about the STAR test, what they call the STAR test, the EOC. I told them that it really, for me, it's secondary because what I love to do is get our kids and get them beyond the test. So like that, when, when they won't really think about the test. They won't have to be gearing up to, to, to just pass the test. They're thinking beyond that. So when it comes to when it comes to the, the test taking, when it's time to take the test, they're ready to go. It's just something that happens natural for them. I know we will, well, you'll have a few of ki few kids who'd still focus and worry about it and so forth. But but my whole objective in my classroom when it comes to biology, because like like I wasn't a student of science as well. It wasn't until my second year in college. I was a business major. Uh, back in the 80s, I saw Wall Street and I wanted to become a stockbroker. So I became a business major until I entered this classroom and this professor just blew me away. He had the whole auditorium and engaged. He, the lessons that he taught and he made them relevant. He made them, uh, spoke about re real life experiences, real world experiences with biology. And that hooked me. And that's when I switched my major over to biology. So another thing that I do in my classroom is I don't want my kids to wait until their sophomore year in college to, to think about becoming a biology major, going into science or going into chemistry. What I do now is, is like I said, is, is I teach beyond the test. And hopefully when they when they get to that time, when they have to take the test, it's it's secondary. It's, it comes natural to them and they know the answers. And I've been pretty successful at with, with the demographics that we have in our area. A lot of English language learners. We have 98 uh, percent uh, 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 Latinos. We have also about 85 percent uh, low socioeconomics in, in, in the school that we're at. And I've been able to stay around 96, 95 percent passing rate with our EOC. So it was it was difficult to walk away because I've, I've been successful at it so far. But uh, I think I, it, it's time for me to it was time for me to move on and take those, these upper level classes. You know, I think I think teachers put a lot of pressure on themselves when they're in a tested grade level. So elementary, it might be all grade levels, uh, tested subjects. Once you hit high school, middle school, you know, it depends on the state that you're in, how that works. But I think teachers put a lot of unwarranted stress on themselves. And frankly, I think that they get a lot of pressure from administrators, both uh, deliberately and sometimes not deliberately. You know, I've been around, I've worked with many administrators who very explicitly tell their teachers that good teaching is the most important thing that we're focused on but they still review data. We still look at state test scores. We still look at our own evaluate, uh, evaluative scores. So teachers naturally feel that pressure. And I completely agree with you, Raymond, that great teaching and great learning experiences is going to provide the best results for, for those standardized tests and teaching beyond the test. But also you can be a little strategic. So, you know, when I taught fifth grade, and we took the math standardized test, a majority of the test is multiple choice. I hardly ever gave my students multiple choice questions unless I wanted to have some quick automatic grading things to sort my students for, for groupings the next day. But I would dedicate time in my classroom to evaluate how to answer multiple choice math questions because they were going to need to do that. And I was very explicit with my students that we're not doing this because the test is the most important thing. However, you're going to take this test and I want you to do as well as you can. So I'm preparing you for it. I'm preparing you for the style of questions that you're going to see. 
the learning experiences that we have on a daily basis, the skills that we're developing in our class, that's what's going to give you the skills to be able to succeed. But I'm not going to send you into an environment you've never experienced before. Simple sports analogy. If you have a practice field, soccer practice field, and you always play on grass, and you are taking your team to a championship game on a turf field, and if you don't ever put take your team to practice on a turf field, you've done them a disservice because it's a completely different playing surface. So I don't care, it, you know, the playing surface is not the thing that you're going to work on the whole year, but you have to expose them to that. So, you know, as teachers, I think we can have confidence in knowing that good teaching and drilling down and focusing on the skills that students need to learn and the experiences we can provide is going to create that positive test result. But you can, at times throughout the year, sprinkle in some, you know, for lack of a better term, test prep, because you're just giving them some skills that they're going to need to succeed. Matt, how do you see it as a, you know, you shared that you're in tested subjects. So how do you see that fit as you've grown, you know, in your position that you've been in for, you know, yeah, 12, 13 so years to now? to kind of tap into that, first off, I'll say, when your wife teaches in the same district at the same grade level, you know testing results matter a little bit more naturally when we're sitting in those data meetings i'm hearing my results related to hers because we have collaborative students collaborative scenarios so while i i do agree it's it's hard for us to not take some uh responsibility uh, behind what those numbers mean, even if, you know, 178 days in a school year, they really don't influence my teaching, um, besides obviously in administering it. So that being said, like, I, I, I feel like there is, a, Raymond, like what you're saying totally makes sense and connects that the idea of pushing beyond and I'll, I'll say, you know, from my fourth grade perspective, this is the first time that kids are not necessarily taking a standardized test. They've done district level assessments. They have a third grade version. The big change in fourth grade, at least in Pennsylvania, is, you know, you have a test booklet that you can do all your work in and you put your final answers in here. Third grade, it's one booklet. It's a little bit shorter. It's a, you know, it, it matters, but it's a little bit more introductory into what this is going to be. And I and I feel like that ramp up to fourth grades quite a bit. We in fourth grade spend a tremendous amount of time dealing with the unknowns of test taking more so than test taking strategies, because kind of Ken, what you're saying is if we show up and they've never filled in a bubble sheet giving them that guidance of how to fill out a bubble sheet in, you know, the 23 seconds it takes for me to read about it is not setting them up for success. Um, whereas maybe Raymond on your end, you don't have to like, they've done plenty of tests. They know the stakes going into it. They are choosing to put their very best, you know, foot forward, maybe they're taking acts and, and SATs in addition, you know, in that near realm, um, they know that it has influence on their, um, you know, future academic pathway too, if they have to do remediation and, and those type of skills. So I, I, I'd be interested to hear, you know, I feel like on polar opposites, I'm trying to keep uh, the anxiety down by, by um, making it feel like not a big deal, whereas it's probably impossible for you uh, to keep anxiety down for kids who know how much is at stake. Um, but, you know, m more of yours is providing generalization skills and um, whatever it may take to provide, you know, uh, as much exposure to content. So when they do come across a variety of different questions, they're able to handle it. Correct. And, and the thing is also what, I, what, what I'm uh, going into now is when the, uh, the AP biology test. So the, skill, the, the, the skills of what I was doing in the past with that work for my freshman level class in the state test, uh, which, which the threshold is really low for passing. Now, when it comes to the AP biology test, now 
I have to change my skill set in my teaching practice and and the different and the different skills that I bring to the table in order going back to what Ken was saying was that having them ready for this test because if we don't expose or it was especially with AP bio we don't expose the kids to these questions or these free response questions from the beginning of the year once they get onto that AP bio test they, they don't stand a chance and uh, first year I taught AP bio was we were fully virtual so um, I crashed and burned so last year we were kind of a hybrid model and we're still teetering back and forth on, and, and trying to have a full classroom. So this is my first year actually getting into hands-on, doing the labs, doing the, everything I need to do with AP Bio. And, and, and one of the things that sits in, in back of me is hovering over me is, are they ready for this type, these type of questions? So that's where the whole testing strategies and understanding the question and, and learning how to, how, to, how, to, how to break down a multiple choice question or a free response question when it comes to the AP Bio test. So this is something new, new for me, and but uh, going back to biology, is it's all about adapting and 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 being able to adapt and like I say it's not the strongest or the smartest that survives, as though they can adapt to change, and and that's a perfect way for me to show my kids that this is something new for me, this level of testing. Now it's time for for, for myself to change and evolve, and let's do it together. So that's where that's where I am at with my my classes so right now. When you transition into teaching AP, you're you're in a new a new course or, you know, that would be similar to an elementary teacher moving grade levels. I often like to have teachers reflect on what that experience is like, because it almost sets you back to year one, you know, where everything was new, but it's not the same because you have all of your skill sets as a teacher. It's really learning the content, the student demographic and those different changes. So what, skills as a teacher, as a veteran teacher, you, what skills do you have as a veteran teacher that have helped ease the transition into a new, more challenging content area that you find is helping your class run more effective? It's, it's the confidence in, in, in believing in yourself. And, and that takes time. And as a teacher, you're always questioning what you're doing in the classroom. And even I've been I'm in it for four, I've been in it for 14 years and I know there's teachers who are, who are still in it longer than I have and they still question what they do in the classroom. It's being able to know that what your limitations are, but also you can push beyond those limitations. And it, this is for me, this is like an experimental year for me when it comes for it for AP Bow. And one of the things one of the things when I talk about uh, confidence and having the agency to do this and the capacity to do this is that I'm not afraid to crash and burn. I'm not afraid to go back to the drawing table. And I think a lot of younger teachers don't understand that yet in the, in the earlier process. Because I, I didn't. If I, if I failed or I have, my kids had bad scores, I, I would carry that weight on me for the next few weeks or so. And I could never get back into the groove until later on, until one of a major break, Thanksgiving break or, or Christmas break came along. But now, because of, of my experience and the understanding of how the, how the learning process works and, the, like you said, the demographics and what, what happens in the classroom and what I also bring to the table and what the kids bring to the table, uh, um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not afraid to, to, to try something out and go back to the drawing table and, re and reflect a little bit and then go back at it again and maybe revisit a topic or reteach. That was another thing that, that I was afraid of as, as a younger teacher was going back and reteaching something. And cause I felt that I did, the, I, I failed the kids. So like I, I, I couldn't move forward, but now I'm, if, if, if I know I failed and it was on my part or, or but, but the bottom line is I, I'm accountable for, for what happens in my classroom. So if I see that my kids aren't learning, I'm not going to hold them accountable to I'll hold them accountable to a certain extent, but at the same time, it, it's up to me for them to learn the content and for them to move forward and be ready to take these exams. And uh, I, I hold that dearly. And I think that's one of the things that, that I'm doing now is I'm not afraid to, to experiment. I'm not afraid to try new things because I know that can, I can always bounce back and I can always move forward. And, and it gives me that leeway to, to try, to try different things and try different strategies, especially with the AP bio it's a whole new, I've taught the, I've taught at the community college bio, uh, but it, with AP bio, it's a whole different ball game. And, you know, now you have a standardized test, you have markers, you have benchmarks that you have to meet. There's certain, there's a certain amount of content you have to cover within the year. So that whole pacing and the whole uh, scope and sequence and along with the tests and along with the free response questions, it's a, it's a whole different animal in itself. But I think I'm confident enough at this point in time and this point in my career that I know if I try something that it's okay, we're going to be okay and we'll be able to move forward and the kids at the end of the day will be successful. So I think one of the, one of the fun things that I'm hearing from you is, you know, you're, you're dealing with, you know, a wide population that has to take the biology shifting to a higher 
level, um, you know, they're intentional about why they're taking AP bio. They're most likely going down that route um, with their careers. And as you mentioned, they're, you know, their instruction is you have a responsibility to get through enough of the content so that they have a chance to be successful on the, um, the, uh, the assessment when, when they would be tested to get a score for it to count for college credit. I guess the question that I have for you is biology is such a practical and uh, related to life, um, obviously, you know, skills. And, and I'm sure when you taught the previous course, you made tons of connections. And I don't know if that was, you know, obviously make connections to your own self and experience, but were you utilizing, you know, your local community? Were you um, kind of tapping into local experts in those areas in that lower, you know, stake, but also important classroom? And did you bring similar experiences to that AP or was it more, you know, focused on book work and accomplishing everything you could? Um, I, I'll use the example, you know, if I were to switch one of the things that I would be upset about uh, grade levels is I've created connections with a meteorologist when we do weather and a, you know, an electrician when we do electricity, a Native American, uh, a Native person for, you know, when we talk about P Pennsylvania history. I would almost be sad to lose those special experiences for my fourth graders if I were to move to a different grade level and it didn't match as seamlessly. So the question really comes down to what are attributes that either you continue to bring in? Are you utilizing those same resources, be, you know, breaking beyond what those base requirements are to make a special experience for your kids? And I completely agree with it. It, it. When it comes to the learning process, especially with biology and it, whether it's ninth grade biology or that dual enrollment biology, college level biology or AP bio, uh, it's all about creating experiences. And it doesn't have to be per se experiences within the classroom. It's something that can, can cross over transition as well. So it's one of the reasons why I'm, I, I'm a sponsor of four clubs. I still don't know to this day how it happened. I'm a sponsor for the anime club. I'm a sponsor for the medical sciences club. I, uh, we just started our first chapter, the National uh, 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 Science Honor Society. And now we uh, just last year, a grant came up and uh, we created our first environmental stu uh, stewardship, stewardship club. And they're all composed of my students. And what we do, what I try to do is create those experience, experiences outside the classroom that we can transition over into the classroom, not only experiences, but also the skill sets and the different opportunities that come, that come with that. When it comes to the medical sciences club, we, we, have, we have guest speakers, for doctors, nurses, uh, professors that come in and talk about the, the career, a career path into nursing or physical therapy and so forth. Then last year, we were, like, we were out at our, at our local uh, wetlands. I know it's out in the desert, but we do have a local wetlands here in El Paso. And we were part of a restoration project that these kids took a part of. And every month we're going out there and spending about four or five hours um, restoring the wetlands and trying to bring uh, trying to bring life to some of the some of the places that, that we're, we're, we're going down. And we transitioned that into the classroom as well. So now uh, one of our one of our fellow teachers has a desert garden. So our kids now um, are, are involved in the in, in upkeeping the desert garden that we have at our at our campus. Not only that, there's there's a pair of burry owls that are are not endangered, but they're they're on the uh, 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 they're on the uh, they're on the list to to be taken care of. And now our kids, you know, they're really fascinated with them. We just we just I just did my first ever project with um, donors choose when we ordered two Wi-Fi cams. So now we can keep an eye on those uh, burrowing owls 24/7. Uh, we have a weather project coming up. We, uh, some of the kids were interested in, in, in weather and how climate change and so forth uh, takes part in it and how it will affect El Paso. So now in about two weeks, for the first time ever, we're going we're gonna to go compete at a, at a weather fest presenting our, our, our project and research. And we somehow, some way, I come back in and tie it into biology. So not only do I stick to the content and all the everything that I have to cover within the year, uh, uh, what I try to do is create those, those experiences. But not only that, at, at this point in time, uh, with, with the years that I have under me, uh, I, I think I've gone more from from delivering content to just trying to facilitate opportunities for our kids, especially with the demographics that we have being so close to the the U.S. Mexico border. I, I'm 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 a border I'm a border raised kid. I, I'm brown. I was born in uh, Brownsville, Texas, South Texas, along the border. Our sister city was Matamoros, Texas, where where my family was going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, 
um, uh, you know, every other month I had family who lived over there. I had family who would cross every day. I had uh, friends that, and friends of, the, of our family also they crossed every day and they would come to school. So I understand what the border, what the border entails and being in the border and being the set of demographics that, where I'm teaching now. So I bring that to the table as well. So I try to facilitate experiences that I didn't have, that I, I wasn't exposed to. So now I try to bring that to the classroom, tie it in with the biology, tie it in with the content. And it turns into just facilitating opportunities, creating experiences, like you said, which is huge because kids walk away with those experiences. They're always going to remember. They're, they might not remember the content per se, but they're going to remember what they did during that time that they, they were experiencing whatever they did. And uh, being able to, to share these stories with my kids of me growing up along the border, that's one of the things also about creating these genuine relationships. The kids in my classroom, a majority of my kids get to see a little bit of themselves in me and I in them when, when I was a student. So it, it's a it's a pretty interesting dynamic that 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 occurs, uh, but I've enjoyed it. I I thoroughly enjoy it. I love creating these experiences, facilitating these opportunities, and now it's on to looking for more bigger and better things for our kids. And that's all I'm trying to do now. I think over the past year and a half, I, well, with the help of my administrators and fellow colleagues, we've been able to secure close to about a million dollars for this new biomed program, and we're taking off from there. This is our second cohort this year. And we're, we're going to try to create, op like I said, facilitate opportunities, create opportunities and experiences for our students. Uh, when, when in, 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 in hindsight, you know, in years in the past, these students would, didn't have an opportunity like this before, and now they will. So I'm just hoping this will be something that will grow into something bigger and better, even if I walk away or, or, or transition to something else. I just want to know that it'll st stick around and pr pr try to leave a legacy for these students. So... When I when I met you two nights ago, just to check our technology for our recording tonight, we got on the topic of conversation with where you live and the challenges and just the the interesting situations that you um, you know you're engaging with in your students and their families and their backgrounds and their experiences. And as a person from Pennsylvania, I found it pretty fascinating the challenges that your school district and your teachers. Are dealing with. And I, I think it's beneficial for other educators to hear because I think everywhere we teach, there are different challenges that we face. Some are definitely more difficult than others, depending on the demographic of your students, the socioeconomic status, and just the other environmental factors that are in there. So can you just share a little bit that you, you told me a, a couple nights ago, especially about the students that are crossing the border daily and just those things that a lot of people may not be aware of that come with teaching and living on a, you know, a border town? Oh, sure. Uh, it, it, it's always been there, but it came to the forefront when COVID hit, especially when there was a lockdown on the bridges about people crossing back and uh, back and forth. Not only that is those kids that come from to school from Juarez, which is our sister city here in El Paso, uh, went back home and weren't able to return. Not only that, they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the Wi-Fi. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have the, the technology they needed to go virtual. So that, that, that brought everything to the forefront on what our kids, our kids from, from, from our sister city are exposed to. And a lot of these kids in uh, last year, well, my little boy had football practice and he had to be at football practice at six in the morning. So as soon as I dropped them off, instead of going back home, I was going to work. And I started noticing where the, these vans and these buses would drop off 15 to 20 kids at our campus. And they were coming, they come from what is so what they do, they wake up about three o'clock in the morning, three thirty in the morning, sometimes four, maybe the latest five, and they they start trekking their way across the bridge. And there's long bridge wait time. So this is why they have to wake up so early just to make it to school by 830. And whenever there's something happening along the US border, there's something that's holding up the the, the transportation along the bridge, sometimes our kids don't make it. And with with COVID, that's that's been the that's been a huge problem right now. And especially right now with with all the Immigrants who are coming in, the, the, the borders are tightening up a little bit. So the kids are having a little bit of difficulty coming, coming to coming or, or, or crossing over. And, and this is something that happens every day. I've taught along uh, what we call along the border. It's called the border highway. There's three, three or four schools along the border highway. And I've taught at all of them. I've taught at Riverside Middle, a middle school. I did one year in middle school. I'll tell you this one never again. I've done uh, my first three years of teaching was at a high school about also about a, a, a mile away from the U.S.-Mexico border. This high school where I'm at right now is about a mile and a half to two miles away from the U.S. Uh, uh, Mexico border. And a lot of our kids, uh, you know, a majority of them uh, do come from from Juarez, from our sister city. And they they have to wake up early and uh, uh, go through all these uh, uh, bridge wait times and uh, and and just try just trying to get an education. 
And sometimes uh, uh, a lot of a lot of us, and and especially some of my students, when they hear these stories, they 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 forget, you know, or, or they forget what what's there for them, this, the the free education that's there for them, and the, what they have to do, their counterparts have to do, just to get over here in order to get that education. That is fascinating, and I had to pull up a map um, as you were kind of speaking about the the demographics and to see that geographic, you know limitation but you know the value of education and what people would do in order to make sure they had access is fantastic and i think i i would imagine your kids hopefully took that with you know uh the message that you're passing on of you know their fellow classmates or people locally what what they have access to and that availability um, hopefully, you know, brings that empathy and, and the appreciation for how things are. I will speak on my behalf as well as Ken's, you know, I, I deal with uh, farm country from the Amish that, you know, are buying houses um, from students that would attend public school. Our, our enrollment is declining because um, the local area is not, you know, uh, is you know, heavily with the Amish, that is not nearly the same style, you know, influence into daily life and culture and, and really a, a juggle um, that, that kids have to go through, let alone to worry about the, you know, AP tests that they're preparing for, or, you know, just managing high school life. That is, I appreciate you speaking to that. Oh no problem, and, and like I said, it's it's uh it's what we call the borderlands, and it, and uh, there's a author uh, Ansaldua that she brought it up. It's just an inter intersectionality of the two different cultures as well, and understanding those cultures. And I think that's what allowed me to be successful where I'm at. Because I'm if you're looking at the map, like you said, I'm at the southern tip of Texas. That's where I was born and raised, right on the southern tip, right at the border town Brownsville, and now I'm on the western tip of Texas, border town as well. And what I experience is what I bring to the classroom. And it's allowed me to understand my students and understand what what they also bring. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the one of the one of the cool things that I love to do is to acknowledge that every student brings a set of experiences from from either whether whether it's Juarez, whether it's in El Paso, wherever they come from. We have a lot of Army students. We have we have the largest uh, one of the largest bases in, in the United States, or the, or the largest base in the United States, Fort Bliss here in El Paso. We we get a lot of Army students as well, and. Uh, what what I like to do what I like to do for for in creating these genuine relationships and establishing the classroom in the first two weeks is acknowledging that every single experience that they bring to the table is worth something. It, it allows you to really embrace the student and embrace what they bring, the culture that they bring, or whatever else they bring, and allows them to feel safe. But not only that, it allows you to learn. And one of the things I like to do most, and a, and a lot of things that I didn't do when I was younger, well, a younger a younger teacher is learn from my kids. And uh, but that's one thing I love to do is learn about my kids. Because not only that, it, it, it allows you to grow as a person and it allows you to form different different perspectives and different frames that you can view your students through. And that changes the ball game as well. Is once you're able to see to see them through their perspective, through their through their lens, as as they see themselves or they see their culture and so forth, it allows you to create these genuine relationships, which really kind of makes it a cohesive classroom. And everybody works together, although they may not all get along together, but it allows me as a teacher to have the, a cohesive unit within my class. Although it's, sometimes it's chaotic, I like, I like to have that controlled chaos in my classroom, especially in a science classroom. But forming those genuine relationships, those first two weeks of school is, is imperative for me. And that's something that I've done uh, through my mid-years uh, mid of teaching and, and, and I carry over and I'm going to continue to carry over. I'm always going to talk about forming those genuine relationships. What strategies do you use to form genuine relationships from peer to peer? So I feel like as new teachers, when we, when we know the value of forming those positive relationships and establishing rapport, at least for me, I felt like my, my focus was on making sure I developed a genuine relationship with the individual student, which is important. However, for a successful classroom, there needs to be a community that's more than just from teacher to student and student to teacher, especially when you start using instructional strategies like, and strategies like you've mentioned with the real world experiences and, and a lot of those project based learning aspects. So what types of strategies are you using to develop those peer to peer genuine relationships, especially with the diverse population of student that you have? 
for me, it's a, it's, it's doing a collaborative work from the very beginning is having placing kids in group. And in the first, the first two weeks, I don't allow them to select their group members or I, I select the groups myself and it's just random. I'll do something random. Sometimes I do a wheel and, and we'll spin the wheel and we'll see who goes into what group. But then I set the expectations of what they have to walk away with. So I'll, I'll provide, I'll, I'll give them a couple of questions while I'm walking around and I'll ask them, what do you know about him? What, what have you learned about your partner? What have you, and, and then not only that, I'll also give each one of them a job. So they know that everybody's responsible for something. Cause then, you know, when you get, when you, especially high school, when you get them in a group, there's always going to be that one kid who doesn't do anything. There's always going to be that kid who does everything. And then that kid in the middle who just r- rides along. So I try I try to counter that by providing everybody a job and holding everybody accountable as I walk around. And, and it's difficult, especially when you have sometimes when you have classes of 30 or 36 and you have eight groups, you know, forming or, 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 or nine groups form and it's difficult to manage. But o- over time, it just becomes it becomes natural, just, just something that you walk around and just try. And I don't I don't go in and um, try to put them on the spot. I just make it a casual conversation. And just ask a simple question. What do you know? You know, just in, in, in the long run, just tell me something about your partners or tell me something that you learned about your partners. And uh, and, and also I do that through uh, a lot of other different different activities where they ask each other questions, uh, you know, back to the whole. I like to go back. You know, I know it's old, but the think, pair, share, uh, you know, where, where they where they where you get partner up with somebody and they're they're, they're not kind of forced it, but they're, they're, they have to be engaged in order to give me a response or the response that I'm looking for once you set those expectations. So, so there's different strategies, but those are the ones I, I, I go back to being collaborative, collaborative groups, holding everybody accountable, uh, providing someone with a job. I select the groups uh, until I, I feel that we've established that trust where I know they'll be able to get the work done on their own and uh, forming partners as well. That hold back to the whole, I know it's old school, but it's a think pair share. And I, I to this day, I still use it. That's because it's a valuable skill. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with that think pair share there's different variations as long as you're setting that purpose, you know, that collaboration that we find, you know, at the elementary level, I'm sure is only magnified at that, that high school level, um, them being able to, you know, question and, you know, not risk embarrassment of, you know, the direction they were thinking things were going and maybe some clarification for sure. I guess my, my, uh, but just to, just uh, just to add right away, one of the toughest parts about high school is this is where kids start wanting to be on their own. A lot of the kids want to be left alone. This is when they start to start isolating themselves. So I kind of break, try to break that and not, not break it. That's one of the reasons I took on the anime club. I'll, I'll share that with you. It's a group of kids who are introverts. Uh, you know, they they stick to their own little clique and they all they want to do is watch anime and talk about gaming and so forth. So I, uh, a few years ago, they came to my classroom because they lost their sponsor and they asked me, do you want to be the sponsor? And I even told them, I said, well, you know what? I don't know the first thing about anime, but I'm going to take it on. But I'm going to tell you, if I take it on, you guys are going to break the mold. You guys are going to start doing activities, school activities, do community service. And when we have our meetings, everybody's going to have to speak. And they agreed. And I've been, this is my fourth year going to, yeah, this is my fourth year being the anime sponsor. And that's what I said is trying to break that 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 pattern where kids at the high school level begin to isolate themselves, begin to wanting to be alone and not to not to be uh, grouped up with anybody. I'll, I'll do it on my own, sir. Don't worry about it. Uh, I tell them that you know that's that's not even an option. You're going to have to either pair up with somebody or or, or join a or join a bigger group. And uh, you know this, this, that's another strategy that I use is not not letting anybody be isolated or be on their own or thinking they could do things on their own. I want them to know that. Group work does work, and it, it, it's it's you know part of what the skill that they're going to need once they go once they go beyond high school. Well, I appreciate you clarifying that because you know my my perspective is, you know, I could work and split the work up amongst my you know friends or you know lighten the load a little bit, but that is a you know a, a, as a you know maybe not the best biology student. I would love to be paired up with someone that was much stronger in that area to be supported. Um, so I guess w- what I have loved about this conversation so far is just witnessing your true and utter devotion to education. And you've talked about, you know, your love of shifting uh, into, you know, a more challenging subject area, but also the opportunities to you know moderate and support for additional clubs do you feel like if you were to talk about your legacy or you know your 
um, the way your students talk about you, would it be from the lens of teacher or, you know, you know, committed to education more so? Because I just, I am seeing just that devotion. And, and you mentioned about, you know, grants being able to open up possibilities. Like it just sounds that you're so bought in because it's good for kids. And I just wonder about if, if you were to identify like your rep reputation, how would it fall? As a committed teacher, and it's all, always all about the kids. And one of the reasons that happens, or not, there are several reasons for that. And it's, it starts with my parents. And I've always shared this story. Anytime I get an opportunity to do so, and this is the perfect opportunity. My parents were, were high, dropped out of school. My dad dropped out in the sixth grade, be, become a migrant farm worker. My mom dropped out in the 11th grade to do the same thing. And when they married and they had my two older sisters, they were still doing, they were still working the fields. They were traveling from the, tip, the southern tip of Texas all the way to Ohio, out into the Midwest to work, work, work the farms out there, work, do field work. And so finally, my, both of my parents decided that uh, this wasn't for them. So they both went back to school and became educators. And that's where the commitment to education comes from, because I know firsthand what an education can do, how it can break uh, the cycles of poverty. Uh, growing up, before my parents became educators, I lived in a two-bedroom home. I had three sisters. The, the girls had their room because girls need privacy. I slept on the couch until I was 17. So finally, both of my both of my parents became teachers and we were able to afford a house and we moved out into a rural area, uh, a nice four bedroom house. We went from a two bedroom house. to And uh, growing up in, in what I call the body growing up, growing up in, in, in the neighborhood I grew up in, it was filled with poverty, drugs. Uh, I'm uh, uh, one of the things that, that, I, that I talk about. Also, I got to witness a, not, a murder. And that's not something that I'm proud of, but it's something that comes along with the going comes along with the, the body I was living in and the, 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 the cultural aspect, the familial aspect that about not having an education where my parents, you know, finally decided, you know what, this is, this is what we want for our kids. Let's do better. So they went back to school. They both became educators and I followed in their path. I know I, I, you know, it's a zigzag on my path to education, but once I entered the classroom, I knew this was it. I knew this is what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to continue the, what, what my parents started, the legacy they started. And that's what I want my kids to walk away with. I want them to walk away knowing that I did everything possibly I could, uh, possibly that I could in the classroom and beyond to give them the opportunities that they deserve. And that goes for all of my students, every single one of them. And, um, and, and it's, a, it, it's, been a lo it's been a long ride. And the thing is also one of the good things about it is and why I'm so committed as well because of my support system at home. My wife isn't an educator, but she's a huge, huge educational advocate. Her, her focus is more on higher ed and providing the opportunities for people like ourselves uh, to have those opportunities who came from, from uh, uh, Latino, Latino households where, where parents didn't have much growing up. And now that we have an education, we, we want everybody to know how great an education can be and the fruits that can come from it, either finding a career or going to school, going to college, getting a master's, whatever the case may be, it all starts with education and being able to read, write, and do some math that that can change lives. And both, like I said, my wife and I are huge educational advocates. That's why I'm able to do the things that I do in and out of my classroom because I have a great support system because my wife also understands the importance of it is because her family also came from humble beginnings. And we both together understand the importance of an education and what it can do for other Latino kids, Latinx kids like ourselves when we were growing up. And that's one of the things my wife always brings up is like, oh, if I could go back and tell my, my little self, you know, how better it's going to be in the future if you just stick it out, if you stuck it out. And, and, and it's right, is, is trying to tell these kids that I know it's tough right now because of everything that's happening outside the classroom, you know, happening in houses, happening at home with families, moving and, you know, family across the border, things that happen across the border, especially in this little area, this border town area, like I said, where there's that intersectionality, intersectionality where, you know, things that happen across the border do affect families here, you know, on the, on the U.S. side. And I experienced that. My wife experienced that. And we bring that to the table. And that's what I bring to my classroom. And that's what I want my kids to, to, to remember me by is that I did everything I could to facilitate opportunities, create experiences in order for them to have a better opportunity, a, an opportunity that I, I didn't have early in life until later on in life. And I'm hoping I could do, I could do and uh, whatever I can in order for, for, to create a launching pad for them to go on into whatever they want to go into. So we recently, first of all, thank you for sharing that. We recently had a guest on who had a, a, a struggling childhood like you, like you just shared and talked about him sharing those stories with his students. And it was a part of his classroom. And it was 
it offered value in him forming relationships with his students and hopefully supporting students that were going through similar struggles in his classroom at the time. So do you share exactly what you just shared with us, with your students? And if you do, is it on day one? Is it on, you know, day 50? Is it more towards the middle of the year? If you do feel the comfort and confidence in doing that, how do you roll it out? And when do you roll it out with your kids? Well, from day one, and it's an, it's almost an everyday thing. I always try to have those teachable moments. You know, there's times when you're teaching content, something pops up, someone's having a bad day, they bring something up. And I always like to spin in, spin into uh, some life, life stories and some life experiences that I've encountered growing up in order for them to understand that it is still gonna, it's still going to be okay as long as you continue to move forward. But I do it from the very beginning, from the very first. I have a presentation that I've used for years with the pictures are changing because the family's been growing. Uh, but uh, I have pictures of my parents working out in the fields. I have pictures of my grandparents in little, little, little houses when they were out. out. Uh, my grandparents were also migrant farm workers. Uh, as well. So I have pictures of my grandparents, pictures of my aunts and uncles, my dad working the fields, my mom and dad working the tomato factories out in Ohio. And then I bring myself into it and I, and I talk about the, the childhood I, I grew up with and the neighborhood I grew up in and how I, I wasn't allowed to go to the schools in, in our neighborhood. My parents actually would drive me across and my sisters across town to what they, what they called a better school. So uh, that in itself it was was uh, it formed an, in, an internal conflict because you had your life at this other school, then you had your life in the barrio, and sometimes those two those two would intersect, and it was it was chaos. So uh, I share all these stories with my students in order for them to understand that what they're going through, I've experienced something similar or maybe something that that re resembles of what they're going through, and uh, and I hope they so like that they can understand that. It's going to be okay that you know whatever they whatever they choose to do and whatever happens in their life, whatever the circumstances are, there's always an answer to something. There's always a, a will to do something, and if you're willing to put the, make the sacrifices and you're willing to put set some things aside, that you'll move forward. That's great. I think it's I think it's so important. And um, Matt, do you want to jump in with something? Because I do want to I want to roll over to our lesson lens because I don't think we've done one with bio. Yeah, so I think that'll be a little yeah. Bit no, fun, I, I just can chime in and then uh, and then we'll we we've had a few it. people and we've recorded a bunch of episodes, but a few people that have kind of been vulnerable with their class and uh, we've yet to hear that it's been you know so embarrassing or you know so revealing that it didn't turn into a positive. And obviously the way you, you deliver the content is a, a big portion of it. You know, if there's trauma and challenge, um, but it's always through the lens of resilience and, you know, from that lens, Hey, uh, you're not going to be able to follow my pathway, but my pathway, if I were in your shoes, like, flashback a few years from, uh, I didn't know that I would end up here, but it all worked out. It's just such a motivating factor and just kind of addicting from the, the lens of kids, because I think what another thing that we've heard is, you know, you're teaching biology, making real life connections, whether it's biomed or, you know, uh, wetlands and, and things that would influence their lives. But then it's also the, the crafting of children to just handle the challenges of life, whether it's border life, whether it's, you know, isolation and wanting to work independently, but knowing we have to work collaboratively, whether it's, you know, all the challenges and limitations that it takes to grow and develop. And, and frankly, to be at an age where you get to choose your future, as opposed to, you know, just having to do whatever it takes to, to kind of um, put enough money uh, on uh, in the household to put food on the, the table, which is just really fascinating. And, and when you put that vulnerability out there, the kids see that sacrifice is often rewarded as opposed to sacrifice just simply being scary. Yeah. And just to add to that, and, and I'm going to share this is uh, – we're all here because of, I tell my kids, we're all here because the second, third, it's not the second chance. It's always the fifth or fourth or the sixth chance is where the reasons, one of the reasons why we're at where we're at. And one of the things, cool things about it is like right now, my wife and I, about four years ago, uh, took a leap of faith and we both entered a PT program. And um, 
I, be, I bring that to the classroom as well. I tell my kids, I understand what it is to be a student because I'm a student right now and it's intense and it's hard. And I have, you know, we have, a, we have a 13 year old, we have a five month old. Um, my wife's getting ready to defend tomorrow. And I've shared that with my class. And right now she just told me, you know what, can you send the link to our, cause the, the, the medical sciences club is, is led by girls. She goes, can you send the link to the girls so the girls can, can have an opportunity to jump on and see my defense. And I'm getting ready to defend in about two weeks. So, you know, this is something I've been talking about to my kids, show, t telling our story, how we started up at a humble beginnings. And now late in life, although, you know, I'm in my forties, late in life, we're getting ready to defend our dissertation and move on the, and move on after that. But that there's nothing wrong with late bloomers. There's nothing wrong with 10, having 10 chances, 11 chances, 12 chances, as long as you said, you know, the resiliency, the perseverance, as long as you have that drive, anything's possible. Some people might get there a lot quicker, but some people like myself, it took a little longer, but why not something, like I said, I'm getting ready to, to defend in about two weeks. My wife's getting ready to defend tomorrow, first thing, eight in the morning. And uh, we share that with our kids. And we, my, like I said, my wife's a big part of our program, of our, of our, of our clubs. And we're, we interact with our kids and we tell them our stories. And, and this is something that, that, that we, we, you know, that we love to do because like that kids understand that it's a struggle. It is, it takes resiliency, it takes drive and it takes motivation to get to where you want to get to. And that, that, I just wanted to end with that on that part. That's amazing. And good luck to your wife and good luck to you mm -hmm. as well in a couple of weeks. Um, I you. think, I think you should have upped the challenge a little bit for yourself and recorded with us the night before your, <laughs> before your defense. <laughs> so I want to, I want to hit our lesson lens, uh, which it. is the uh, portion of our show where we try to dive deep into something specific that you do with students. So Matt and I are going to rattle some questions back and forth to you. So try to answer the questions directly, but also, you know, add anything that you want to for it. So first question, are we going to, are you going to tell us about a unit overview, a long-term project or a single lesson? A single lesson. All right. I'm going to have you clarify uh, the grade level um, subject area. I, I have a pretty good suspicion. What but it at least be. the course, it um, could be a different, one of the different. Bodies. Yeah. Is it one of the different courses? And then uh, would it be time of year specific? It's a uh, ninth grade and uh, it could be at any time of the year, to be honest, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. All right. And what are the objectives of the lesson? Uh, the objectives of the lesson, well, it, it, it depends uh, if, if you want to look at it from the biology perspective, because it has a different lens and, and it, ha it has to do with language acquisition, which is because of uh, the where, where I'm located. We have a lot of English language learners. So it's uh, the, this lesson that's always stood with me and, and, and especially it allowed me to, to move forward and, and gain some some momentum and confidence after after uh, creating this lesson or, or for, framing this lesson is uh, has to do with language acquisition in a biology classroom. And the focus is biomolecules. Interesting. So through this lens, um, what would you say the students are expected to do actively throughout that lesson? So this is geared towards English language, English language learners, but it's a different subset of English language learners. It is the subset of, of those learners that um, use both English and Spanish as their form of uh their main form of communication which is their their primary their primary um their primary language which is spanglish and as teachers we've always been told it's either all english or it's just spanish but uh, through this lens these uh, i was able to view these kids progress from using spanglish where they alternate you know fluidly and without any hesitation between Spanish and English, and it's something that I grew up with. Uh, even to this day, I have a conversation with my parents. It never ends in all English and it never ends in all Spanish. I, uh, that conversation, we go back and forth. We switch back and forth through sentences and the syntax and how somehow, some way, the syntax and the frames arrange, the phrases that are arranged in structure, it all flows well. And this is something that I caught my eye when I was in the biology classroom, and especially with the demographics and location that I'm at that caught my eye and I use that as a way, as a form of uh, language acquisition. So I allowed my kids to use, a group of kids to use Spanglish and I still do now. It's something that I bring to my classroom. There's a kids, even, even when they're presenting, the first few times they present, they're allowed to use Spanglish in the classroom. But as we progress throughout the year, then eventually I want them to use just all English. Can you clarify what you mean by the, the biology in terms of the biomolecules and the language acquisition? So the biomolecules, it's, it's a tough subject for kids to, to comprehend. It's a very abstract 
Uh, you're talking about these large molecules that sustain life. And just the vocabulary in itself is, is difficult. Even speaking about them is difficult when they're having just normal conversations, when you're doing that think, pair, share, or collaborative or, 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 or group work. So uh, I want my kids to feel com comfortable and confident with their own vocabulary and what they bring to the table, like back to the whole acknowledging their experiences. If the Spanish is, is what they know, then allow them to use it. Allow them to learn the content, to read what they need to read. And, and, and at the end, I know that eventually they're going to progress into just using English and using the, vo the, the, the vocabulary that's part of the content and the required vocabulary that's, that's needed, you know, for, for testing or it's needed just to, to, to learn the objectives. Got it. So you're, you're leveraging their, um, the language they're comfortable in speaking and using that as kind of your, um, your benchmark for understanding, you're not worried about them understanding the content and understanding the vocabulary in, in, um, perfect English it challenging mm -hmm. them in two ways. Am I understanding that correct? Correct. Yeah, that is correct. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I, I like that. So I feel like you kind of answered our, our next question, um, in terms of what your role is to ensure student success. So for the last question, what advice do you have for yourself uh, as you progress with teaching this lesson or just kind of using this strategy to apply across other concepts that you're teaching? What have you done to improve the, the use of the Spanglish? Now it's said that I did that early and in, 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 it was, I think my third year teaching when I, when that came into, and I was working on my master's and I had to pick a lesson that, that I did. And it's that, this is something that caught my eye and now I just carry it through. It's, it's part of my everyday classroom. Uh, I start off slowly. I tell the kids, even, even Spanish speakers, that they're allowed to use the Spanish in the very beginning of the of the year and something they feel comfortable with, but that they, they, they know what their expectations is when they leave their class, my classroom, that everything has to be given back to me in English. And uh, they can revert back to it every now and then. There's a, a period of transition, but uh, but at the end, at the end of the at the end of the year, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear all my conversations in in English. With, with, you know, of course, because of, like I said, because of the location where we're at, you, they're still going to hear a little bit of Spanish here and there. But in the end, I want, I want the kids to fully understand what is required in order to be able, back, going back to passing the exams, reading the questions, understanding the directions, and so forth. Makes sense. Thank you for sharing. So mm -hmm. we're going to wrap this up. Uh, not that I want to end the conversation, but to be <laughs> cognizant of our time, we're going to jump into our exit ticket, which is the same four questions we ask every guest every week. Question right. number one, what is the best thing a teacher can do to make a student's school experience better? Smile. As I, I'm a proponent. As soon as a kid walks into the class, you have that big smile that even when the kid walks into class, that split second when you all exchange smiles, that sets the tone for the rest of the day. Even if it's for that split second, just smile. What would you say is the best piece of advice that you've received um, instructionally or educationally? And it could have come from you know, a colleague, a supervisor, or even a student? You know what? It was last year. It was a student. And I was trying something new. And this goes back to uh, learning from your students. And the class wasn't clicking. And the, everything I was trying to do, I was trying to do different things. And I spoke about that earlier. And so I finally had a student just be honest and sincere. came up to me and said, sir, what you're doing isn't working. We're trying, but we don't get it. So that allowed me to take that in, reflect, and then try something else or go or revert back to some older strategies that I've used. And it's, it, for me, it's a learning from your kids and being able to take criticism from your kids as well, from your students. I think that's, that's, that's huge. That's huge. And, and it was, it was that student. I know I've heard other things. There's others out there, but last year was an eye opener when it was the first time in, in my career that a student came up to me and said, sir, what you're trying isn't working. And I think those, those words still, are, are, are in my head as it would happen yesterday. And now it allows me to stay cognizant of what I'm doing in the classroom and what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to accomplish. Am I doing it for myself or am I doing it for the kids? And that alone, I, 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 this is the first time sharing that. And I, I hope whoever listens to it is, is to take to heart to listen to your kids sometimes. And they might tell you a little truth, but it may hurt a little bit. But in the end, it's for, in the greater scheme of things, it's for them. Well, and it also speaks to the relationship and the rapport you're establishing with your students that they were comfortable to say that to you. So, you know, I think there's that that element there where, yes, you it's important to read your students and hopefully when they don't get it, they just straight up tell you like they did. 
but you have to establish those trusting relationships and rapport Correct, yes. to, mm-hmm. to feel confident to do that. And I would also add, you know, you have to be as an educator in a position to handle that criticism or suggestion, yeah. you know, sometimes we struggle with, you know, taking that and using it productively. And it sounded like it in, influenced in a very positive way. So the next yeah, question, we're, we're built to say that we're the masters of our classroom. I know And that. when you hear something like that, you're just like, oh, yeah. I, I, and it's it's hard to. You know, we sit there, we plan these lessons thinking that we've covered all the features. What are the, you know, uh, limitations? What could be the parts that fall fall apart? And that's what we're professionals. But as you mentioned, you, you're trying different things and trying to figure out what is the, you know, best way to handle it. I think um, for you, maybe your timeline right now is uh, falls in one of those very stressful times with your dissertation coming up. But um, one of the things we all recognize as educators is that the school year goes in waves and there are days or even weeks that we struggle to survive. Um, and, that, and that's just, you know, with general teaching responsibilities. What is something that you feel like you would want to pass on to educators listening that help them power up through those moments of struggle? Believe in the process. Whatever you're trying to accomplish or whatever your end game is, and you, you're you confident in, in what you're believing, you're confident in what you're doing, uh, just trust, trust in yourself and trust in the process. Uh, it may not always, the process may not always go the way you want it to, but at the same time, you still have some ways to manipulate the process and get back to it. And uh, it's in your hands. Uh, you can either crumble and and quit the process. And if you're trying something new or it's a new, a new administration that comes in or you're just trying to adjust to something or trying to adapt to something, it, it goes back to the whole uh, the whole Charles Darwin quote, you know, I always bring it back. It's, it's not the smartest, the fastest or the strongest to survive. It's those that can adapt to change. And if you trust in the process and you can adapt to change, then everything's going to be okay. I love it. <clears throat> it's easy to fall into facilitating a repetitive classroom. What do you think separates teachers that are constantly seeking change, innovation, and pursuing new teaching strategies for their classroom? Oh, I think for, for me, I, I need it for in, in order to function. It's hard for me to, it's rare that I use, I do use things throughout the years. There's some, there's some lessons and there's some strategies and there's some things that are units that I go back to that I've used in the past that have worked. But I'm always looking for different ways to to engage our kids. And one of the things is is that uh, I have to, going back to those relationships, understanding your kids. So every year in the way I teach, you're always trying to create these genuine relationships. So every year you're reading your classroom, you're reading the students, you're reading the, demo, the, the, the demographics that are in front of you. So every year is going to be different now. But you just have to stay, stay true to your, the fundamentals of the learning process and being a teacher, but at the same time, being able to change the things that you need to change in order to meet the needs of all your kids. And every year you're going to have a different set of kids. So that means every year those needs are going to be different and being able to adapt, being able to change and being able to, to, to meet those needs is, is which allows me to stay on the forefront of research, listening to podcasts, learning from others, uh, professional developments when they're free, try to jump on, and uh, try to read, try to read as much as you can. And also another thing I love to do is walk the hallways. And when the doors are open, that's some of the biggest professional development that you'll have is when you get to see your other colleagues doing what they do at their best. That in itself is priceless. I couldn't agree more. That is uh, something that, you know, I, I unfortunately walk into a colleague's classrooms often creating disruption, but maybe I need to change that, uh, that perspective and, and be productive with it. Um, I know that I have loved this conversation and the few moments that we've had to, to spend with you. Um, and it seems like there, there have been uh, some great phases in your life already uh, and teaching career. And I guess what I'd love to know is, is there a best way for us to keep in conversation and see what what life's like for you, um, whether it's related to you, your PhD, what's going on in your classroom, what is the best way for our audience to continue to, to stay connected with you? 
Oh, that's a good question. I've never, I've never been asked that question. Uh, it's, uh, I, I teach at the Isla Independent School District, I, but I do have uh, a website. Uh, I haven't used it in a while it's ever since uh, the PhD program came into the long. So I'm hoping after, I, after uh, we finish this, I'll be able to go back and, and, and update the website. And, and, but uh, at the same time, uh, 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 my uh, email address is r, uh, rbscienceeducation at gmail.com. Anybody wants to send me a message or, 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 or ideas, looking for ideas, or you just want to talk, that's fine with me also. I, I'm open to uh, anything. I'm always here to learn. And being able to speak to you, being on, be, being on this podcast and engaging with others is, is like I said in itself, is, is professional development that's, that's priceless. You, you can't put a price on it. And uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to uh, continue this conversation either with you all or with anybody else that's listening. Yeah, absolutely. And I will ask you to uh, send over that email, or I'm sorry, the uh, website URL, so I can link up to that, uh, okay. as well as your email, as well as I'll throw on your Twitter handle there, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, no problem. Yes. R underscore oh. Benavides2, uh, where mm -hmm. you can find you on Twitter, where you'll also see in his Twitter description that I'm pretty, unless I missed it, I'm pretty sure you didn't include this in your description of who you are in your journey in education. Raymond, not shockingly, after hearing this conversation, is the 2022 Texas Teacher of the Year, which is something yes. to be extremely proud of. <laughs> yes, um, that's a... and, and don't be afraid to say that because it's a well-deserved award and an incredibly uh, difficult I completely forgot to... about that. Yes, yeah, so the 2022 <laughs> Texas Teacher of the Year. Yes. <laughs> that's right. It they... was It was only this year that you were a Teacher of the Year. It's been a while since the, the award happened. So I know you <laughs> were able to go through a lot of those incredible experiences and, and use that as another avenue for you to have a positive impact on education. But it's incredibly obvious that your, your school is really lucky to have you. So uh, Raymond is a great person to follow on social media, and I would encourage you to reach out because I would guarantee you that he's going to respond because I can just tell you're a very good, genuine person and you want the best. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I, I loved it. Absolutely. We were, we're thrilled to have you on. So everything will be linked up on our show notes page, which can be found at poweredu.up.com slash show 93. You can follow myself on, at, on Twitter at Ken Ehrman, our show at poweredu up, and Matt is at edtechneighbor. If you have not already, please subscribe to this podcast, whatever platform you are listening to on, or if you're watching us on YouTube, you can hit the subscribe button there as well. Also, if you haven't, please leave a review on Apple for us. We've actually had a lot uh, filter in over the last couple of weeks. It's just a great way to help us find new educators to listen to the amazing stories, amazing strategies and ideas of our guests that Matt and I get to hear on a weekly basis. So Raymond, thank you again for your time. Thanks thank for you joining all. us. Mm -hmm. Appreciate and it. And Matt, why don't you take us on out of here? All right. As we power down this episode, Raymond, you definitely left us feeling powered up. Um, and we appreciate the time tremendously. Um, everyone, stay well, stay healthy. We're starting to get into germ season. Um, and so do whatever it takes uh, inside and outside the classroom to make sure that you can show up each day, bringing your very best. Looking forward to the conversation next week. We'll talk to you then. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're listening to or watching us on YouTube. Each week we get to talk to amazing educators who are making a positive impact on the lives of students, their colleagues, administrators, and education as a whole. It's been such a privilege every week to be able to talk to these incredible individuals, learn from them, grow with them, and better myself and all of education through these conversations. If you haven't already, please consider sharing this with a colleague, someone who can benefit and be powered up from the experience of listening to these incredible conversations. Because of Powered Up, we are powering education by empowering you.